Good afternoon. We'll try it again. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good. And welcome to the Fireside Chat of the Aspen Institute. We uh, instituted these Fireside Chats uh, starting, I believe, last year. And the idea is to have very interesting people join us kind of after skiing and before dinner and uh, give us their thoughts. And today we are very fortunate to have a very interesting person, Mickey Edwards. And Mickey is a triple threat. Mickey it was a very successful member of Congress for 16 years, starting in 1974, uh, 76, from Oklahoma. And he was on uh, two critical committees, the Budget and Appropriations. And he was uh, in part of the leadership of the Republicans in the Congress. So he's had a, uh, just a wonderful political career. Secondly, he has been a, made a great contribution to academia. He's been a lecturer at Princeton University. He teaches a course that is very, very popular at George Washington University. His students really love him because I've been a guest speaker at that time, and uh, they're very sharp students, and they really think the world of uh, <clears throat> Mickey. And uh, he just a, came out with a book and lots of columns. And uh, his book is Revitalizing Conservatism, Reclaiming. Reclaiming Conservatism, and we'll talk about that. So he's really made a, a great contribution in terms of the academic side. And thirdly, he's a great program administrator. He runs the Rodell Fellowships, which is a program that the Aspen Institute started uh, about uh, four or five years ago, and it, it's a great program. It brings together uh, elected officials from both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, to meet several times a year, to go on foreign trips, to have seminars, including kind of great book seminars, and basically to see that members of the other party are, may have different views, but you don't have to be, you can have different, uh, disagree on issues, but not be disagreeable. And it really has uh, really led the way towards a civility and a uh, gentleness and a, an appreciation. For a lot of these politicians and elected officials, it is a uh, seminal experience for them. And uh, we were sad to realized that Gabby Gifford uh, was one of the uh, first in the Rodell Fellowships, and, and Mickey will tell us about, you know, what the class has done since, that, uh, since the shooting in Tucson on that. So uh, besides all that, Mickey is um, wonderful. He uh, goes home at night, and he does three crossword puzzles for the uh, New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today, and uh, he is an avid... Cleveland Indians fan, so on baseball. All right, so there's one other in Pitkin County, I think. So uh, <laughs> you have a fellow fan there. Uh, <laughs> you, actually, <laughs> actually, we're having our Rodell Fellowship meeting right now, and one of the fellows uh, is a state senator from Ohio whose family owns the Cleveland Indians. Oh, good. Okay. I'm not the only Indians fan. You're not. You're not. <laughs> All right, so now we know how he got into the program. Uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> So, Mickey, grab your mic, and, um, and uh, let's start. We'll, we'll, Mickey and I will talk for just a few minutes and then open it up to you. Uh, the idea is that Crystal will be here with microphones, and rather than have a lot of dead time, if while someone else is asking the questions or Mickey is giving the answers, you could just indicate to Crystal, come on over here, Crystal, so everybody can see you. On there, and Crystal helps us organize all this. So thank you, Crystal, for everything you do on this. And uh, just indicate so you're holding one of the mics. We have two mics going. So uh, like I say, when uh, Mickey is through answering a question, we're ready to roll on the next question rather than have Crystal go. So let's start off on the big issue, uh, which is the question of civility and politics and all. Um, Mickey, but give us, because you are a scholar, give us some kind of historical appreciation. Are things more divisive in America today than they have been in the past? Uh, is the climate, political climate, worse? What do you think about all this? 
it's a lot worse than it was when, when I got to Congress and, and worse than it was uh, really any of the time that I was in Congress. But it, it's, it, it's not just Congress. A good friend of mine, Bill Bishop, uh, who is a reporter for the uh, Austin American Statesman, wrote a book called The Big Sort. Uh, and The Big Sort was about the fact that while people in the political elites, members of Congress, uh, others, uh, are divided uh, politically, and that they they have a an antipathy toward people of the other party and other views. That's the way America is too, uh, and we we have uh, we're all very familiar. And I don't have to repeat, you know, what we see about people on the right, whether it's in the media or other places, uh, and what they have to say about their political opponents. Uh, it happened that uh, on election night uh, uh, this past uh, in November. Uh, I was watching the uh, election results uh, with a number of friends of mine, many of whom are, are fairly liberal. No, they're very liberal. Uh, and every time a, a, the picture was shown of a Republican uh, who had you know, won an election, uh, they would hiss and they would say, Nazi, fascist. And I, I got up and walked out. And, and you know, because you know, Marco Rubio may not be for single payer health care, but that doesn't make him a Nazi. And uh, so American discourse is that way, and, and the, the, what you find in your town meetings, what you find uh, in the political advertising, what you find on both Fox and MSNBC. I've always said if I could just take you know, Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and Keith Olbermann and Rachel Maddow and put them all in the same bag and drop them off the same bridge, we'd be a little bit better off. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, it's worse. Let me worse. say that's, that remark is not a remark to show the way to civility, though. Well, I... <laughs> I, I, civility is not our only problem. Civility is one of the problems we have in our, mm -hmm. in our political system, but it's not the only one. Okay, so you do think it's worse than when you joined the Congress, because, which was 1976, because the fact is when I came to Washington, it was 1967, and it was the height of the Vietnam War, and uh, you know, there was a whole group outside the White House saying, hey, hey, LBJ, how many babies did you kill today? And then uh, we had Reagan's election, and everybody went crazy thinking he was going to blow up the world. And um, two million people protesting in Central Park. Then you had the Clinton impeachment. And, you know, we go through these cycles of everybody seeming every political pundit saying it's never been worse. Yeah, the difference, Ken, is that what happened then was this kind of animosity would arise on an issue. It might arise on abortion. It might arise on Vietnam. Now it arises on everything all the time. It's about the president and, and Sotomayor and Kagan and the health care bill and TARP and stimulus and, you know, everything it is. You know, it, it's just one side is evil and the other side is good, whichever side you're on, you know. So, I mean, yeah. so, it, I, I think it's a much more toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And what would you do about it? I'll get to that. Uh, you know, it's, we're uh, there, Mickey. Look, I mean, look. There, there are there are a lot of things. We 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 have a lot of problems uh, that have taken over uh, our political system. Uh, money has always been uh, a factor where people with more money had more influence than people without money. But television, of course, has magnified the effect of that uh, because people who have a lot more money than other people, whether it's corporations or labor unions or whatever it is, uh, have disproportionate influence through the media. Uh, you have the rise of talk radio and, and talk television. Uh, and you, you have, I'm sorry if I offend people, from the grade school level through graduate school, we have absolutely terrible educational systems uh, in the country. I taught at Harvard for 11 years. I taught at Princeton for five. Uh, and, and the number of people who don't know anything about our form of government uh, is appalling. And you know, so that's part of the problem. Uh, and I'll get to the rate. I want to say more in a little bit. But, but the, you know what the number one problem is? Look, uh, we, we just got through studying uh, in, in, the, in our uh, fellowship program. We talk about James Madison, who, I, in my view, was the greatest uh, American. Um, and George Washington and James Madison both warned against political parties. They both said political parties will destroy the system. It is the rise of the political parties controlling district lines, 
who gets to be on the ballot, uh, who gets to sit on what committees, you know, that everything is a nonstop partisan war depending on which private club you belong to or the Republican club or the Democratic club, you know, so that you're always in opposition to people from the other side, no matter what they say, uh, is really undermining our whole democratic process. And I, I, and I can get into that in a lot more length. That's the real biggest problem. We but have. there's no way to have a political system without political parties. I don't know any democracy I, I without mean, political. Like, I mean, name, name a democracy without that, a political there, party. There are going to be. Our, our problem is not the existence of parties. Okay. That the pro, people are going to come together. They they share affinities about different things. Uh, the the Federalist Papers in Madison talked about the need for factions. You have to have one faction checking another faction. But those were shifting factions. Mm -hmm. So you and I might be together on one faction and on one side, and another issue, she and I might be together. But but you know, it was never envisioned that you're together all the time on everything. Mm -hmm. And th that's what's different. Mm -hmm. Okay. The fact is, you know the politics from the inside, not just teaching at Harvard, teaching at Princeton, teaching at George Washington. When you went through your day for 16 years on two very powerful committees, how much did money influence your vote? Money did not influence the position I took, but money certainly must have influenced what information I had uh, because it, it provides... Uh, people who contribute to your campaigns, they, you know, I, I have beliefs, and I'm not going to sell out my beliefs because somebody in those days, the most you could give was $1,000, and it cost me a quarter of a million to run a campaign. I wasn't going to, for $1,000, sell out everything I believed. But there were people who came to my fundraisers, people who sent checks who I got to know. Uh, and so they would call me up, and they'd say, Mickey, I want to come by and say hi. Uh, and so there was a, a degree of... Uh, I had a staff. My staff was instructed to do all possible to get both sides of every issue. Uh, but money did have a disproportionate, and it had, it, through the advertising, had a big influence on my constituents. And I had some obligation to listen to my constituents, and so they would contact me, uh, and that had an influence. So sure. So uh, the summary would be that the money influenced your uh, uh, receptivity to visiting with them, but not necessarily your vote. So once they visited with you, what did they get out of it? Ticket, tickets to go see the White House. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh -huh. our whole system, remember, is, is not designed to protect the government from the people. Yeah. It is to give the people access and the ability to try to influence outcomes. And so the people who came to see me were able to walk out of the office knowing whether they met with me or with uh, uh, one of my staff members, that they had done the best job they could of making the case for their position. Mm -hmm. and, and sure, that influences you in every decision you make. You know, it's uh, when, when you get a lot of good information that makes sense affecting the people in your constituency or whatever, uh, it, it, it does have an effect on your decision making. Mm -hmm. So you would listen to them and they would sure. give you information and, and that would mold your thinking. Mm -hmm. well, one of the factors, absolutely. Why did you leave Congress? I got really mad. You know, uh, you? at the last election uh, that I ran, uh, I was there 16 years, uh, the voters voted, gave more votes to the other guy, and so I got mad and left. <laughs> <laughs> you showed them, Mickey. <laughs> They're still licking their wounds from that one. <laughs> and looking back at it, before we open it up, and I'm ready to open it up, so indicate to Beth and Crystal, uh, you know, if you'd like the mic, and uh, just keep it floating. Uh, but tell us, looking back at your time in, in Congress, give us the high points and the low points, not just events, but what, what you think of it overall. You know, I, I think this is, is going to surprise you. For one thing, being in Congress is a very special honor. Uh, there's a, a guy named Daniel Milbank who writes for the Washington Post, and he wrote a column uh, in which he talked about President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, going overseas on a foreign trip uh, and said that for the following week or week and a half, whatever it was, uh, the president was going to step out of his one role as the head of government to function in his other role as head of state. Uh, and uh, at that time I was teaching in Princeton, so I asked my, my students, well, what do you think of that? You know, the president is stepping out of his one role as head of government to function in his other role as head of state. And, you know, they, well, okay, he's talking about basing rights or he's talking about trade agreements. You know, no. 
The answer is the president's not the head of government. This isn't Peru. You know, we have three separate equal branches, and the branch that has the power over war power, taxes, spending, creating programs is the Congress. Uh, and so I, I, I felt that being in the House was a marvelous opportunity to try to have an impact on public policy, you know, for what I believed and for what my constituents believed. But, you know, the things that stand out are not necessarily about whether you vote for health care or not health care. The hardest thing, the low point, it happened that I was, um, I was the floor leader, one of the two floor leaders, on the House floor for authorization to go into the first Gulf War after the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, I had been in a meeting at the White House with uh, uh, the first H.W. Bush, uh, who announced that he was going to send troops in to drive Saddam out of Kuwait. Uh, and I said, well, Mr. President, you can't do that. You don't have the authority. Congress has to approve it. Uh, but, you know, that I thought it had to be done, and I supported him. Um, but there is never, I don't care whether you're right wing, left wing, whatever you are, there is never anything as hard in your life as voting to go to war. Because there are young men and women. I taught 11 years at Harvard, five at Princeton. I had a lot of young people I knew, and they go get killed if you vote to go to war. And so that's the low point. I mean, that's the worst thing ever. Uh, the high point, you know, I was, I was in Poland uh, when Soviet tanks were in the streets in Warsaw and during the uh, occupation, and we went to a hospital, and, and Polish children had made these little pro-U.S. signs that they, they gave us to bring back. Uh, there was a, a child born in the Philippines with a heart defect, and a relative who lived in uh, Oklahoma City, my district, said, we, you know, this child is not going to get the care that she needs in the Philippines, uh, and can you help? And because of the position I was in in Congress, uh, and I was close to the president, I was able to get uh, an Air Force plane to fly that, that baby back to a hospital in Oklahoma City, saved her life, just a newborn. I was later invited to her high school graduation and to her marriage. Uh, you know, I mean, th those are things that, that being in that kind of an office gives you an opportunity to do that are uh, immeasurable. There's a wonderful quote from the Talmud that says, <clears throat> if you save one life, it's like you save the whole world. So good for you, Mickey. Please. What has me somewhat baffled is uh, there seems to be such enormous hostility towards a man named Barack Obama. He doesn't do anything. Congress does it. I mean, he can propose things and he can talk this way and that way, but w w what is all this hostility towards? It seems so personal to me, and uh, as a supporter of him, I'm very offended by it, but uh, uh, you're, you're in the, the mix. So, because I would like your thoughts. Now, let me add on that. Uh, do you think there's a racial element to it, Mickey? No, I don't think there's a racial element. I, I uh, uh, as it happens, I have to say, I, I'm a Republican. I've been a Republican all my life, and I supported Obama. Uh, I supported Obama as a repudiation of the Bush administration, which we can get into if you want to. But uh, there, there is, uh, there are a couple of things. One, one is I used to fear that the greatest danger in our society was that people were uninformed, that people didn't know anything. Now we have the opposite problem. People know too much that's not true. Uh, and so with the internet and the anonymity and uh, other things that we have, there, there are stories spread, you know, uh, and, and some people who pretend to be smart, like Newt Gingrich, who run around call him a secular socialist, which proves he doesn't understand either word. Uh, you know, though, there, there's a lot of that. Uh, but look, I'll tell you the guy who I thought best summed it up. Uh, I was on a panel uh, in Washington at the Center for American Progress. Bill Clinton spoke, uh, and then uh, I was uh, on a panel with Kendrick Meek, who just ran for the Senate. He won He's a Rodell fellow. Uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, th this was at, in response to or at the anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, which was in my district. Um, and Bill Clinton said he understood 
the anger in the country, you know, violence is obviously out of the question, but he said the world is changing very, very rapidly in, in lots of ways, and people are losing their homes, and people <laughs> were losing their businesses and losing their jobs, uh, and values were changing, and, and that you could understand that a lot of people felt unnerved by the ground shifting under them. Well, Barack Obama became a symbol of that because he was promoting policies that the pre people who are most upset with him, uh, you know, I think are, are, are too liberal. They, they think that the mighty river of American government has flowed out of its banks and is, you know, getting to be harmful rather than beneficial. Uh, and um, so I, I, some of that, it, he's, he's the symbol. I mean, the Congress may have more actual power, but he's on television every day. You know, everything he does is in the newspaper. So he's the symbol uh, of government, and people are very worried about what they see happening in society. Uh, I don't agree with them, but I think that uh, uh, he's the, he, I don't think it's about, I, I think it's about politics. I don't think it's about race. Mm -hmm. And uh, you voted for him. Do you think he's doing a good job as president? Um, I think he does a good job in some areas and not, not good in others. You know, it's too early to judge. I think people forget that uh, Ronald Reagan, who you worked for and who I was chairman of the policy task forces for Reagan, we both just showed why our hair is white, but... Um, but uh, I know, dye my hair, man. Yeah, well, I think... My hair is uh, jet black, actually. Reagan, uh, you know, when Reagan won in 1980, a lot of the people in his administration, uh, James Watt and others, thought they had been given a mandate to move the country to the right. Well, that isn't. People had voted against Jimmy Carter and some of the other things. Uh, there was no mandate to vote to the right. And two years later in the midterm elections, you know, they pulled the chain and, and elected a lot more Democrats. And I think in Barack Obama's case, a lot of the people... And two years later, he yeah. won 49 states. Right. Uh, the only one he didn't right. win was the one he didn't go into was Minnesota. But yeah, so, Well, I mean, you're right. But so uh, he adjusted uh, and uh, Bill Clinton adjusted and uh, Barack Obama has had two years uh, he, uh, he is already showing, uh, people in his administration and in the Congress uh, misread the, uh, the results of the election. They thought the country just voted to move to the left, which it hadn't. Um, he's making changes. He's making changes in his economic team. He's making changes in his White House team. He's doing a lot pretty close to what Bill Clinton did. So I, it's way too early to tell whether, you know, whether he's in trouble or not. He's, he's got two years you know, to, to pull this out. There, please, and identify yourself. Just give us your name for uh, Mickey. Hi, I'm James Arnott, and um, one of the things I observe is that on the liberal side, there's um, sort of an intellectual culture that's entrenched, and it's out there in the public sphere, and on the conservative side, there's almost a repudiation of intellectual discourse and dialogue, and it comes to mind um, Sarah Pal Palin's Real American mantra kind of um, goes against intellectual currents. And I'm wondering, how do you stand for yourself as an intellectual conservative, and, and how can others do that as well? Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of uh, brain power on the conservative side. It's not me, but uh, at American Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, good, sound, scholarly work being done on the, on the conservative side. Uh, the problem is when you get into the politics, not, not, not the people who are actually doing the, the work on analyzing issues and coming up with proposals, but when you get into the politics, you're right, I, the party... Uh, I, I thought the example I would have used is we seemed uh, a couple of years ago ready to turn all the nation's problems over to Joe the plumber. I, you know, I'm ready for Joe the plumber to fix my sink, but not to handle the economy. Uh, and we, we had become, we did, we did appear to be hostile to intellectual activity. Uh, and that bothered me a lot. It's one of the things I wrote about in my book, that we, we had become... Uh, I don't know for whatever we began to see uh, the elites in the universities and all uh, as hostile to conservative values, uh, and therefore we needed to turn everything over, you know, to the uh, uh, less educated, or not less educated, but, but somebody who's not trained in economics to do economics, somebody not trained in medicine to do heart surgery. You know, we, we just seem to go bananas. I mean, I, I agree with your <laughs> basic point. 
Is that a technical phrase? <laughs> Go bananas? Yeah. Ricky? yeah. Okay. We use Good. it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Please. Uh, Jerry Cayley. <laughs> Uh, could you comment on earmarks back at your time in, in the government and versus today, and how do you control them? And did you, know, you do earmarks? Yeah, damn right I did. And, and <laughs> like every other member of Congress, they say, oh, my God, I'll, yeah, I hope nobody found out I did an earmark. Are you kidding me? You do an earmark, and you go back and have a press conference. <laughs> you know, and you say, look, I, I just helped create these jobs in my community. Uh, so... Look, there, there's a couple of things about earmarks. There's a real problem with earmarks. Earmarks themselves are not the problem. It is the Congress of the United States that's supposed to make the decisions about where you spend your money, not the executive branch. And if you think about it, if you just simply approve the president's budget, there's no transparency. There's no accountability. Somebody somewhere in one of the agencies decided to spend money on this dam instead of that dam, on this highway instead of that highway. You don't know who. You don't know who they were related to. So there's no transparency. The problem is that in Congress, when you consider the budget and, and add-ons to the budget, the earmark is, is an add-on to the budget, it should be voted on. It should be transparent. The name of the sponsor should be public. You know, you stand up in your committee. You don't meet privately the way it has been done. You meet with the chairman of the committee privately and say, can you stick this into the bill and nobody will notice it. You need to require that all of the earmarks be identified by sponsor uh, and publicly voted on. That would solve the problem. But there is something uh, smelly about <laughs> the idea of doing an earmark for a business or labor or anything in your district, and have them make a great contribution to your uh, re-election campaign. That, that's smelly. It's the contribution that's the problem. It's, it's, it's not the earmark. It's not, not the spending. Uh, and, you know, all that there, first of all, I continue to think there ought to be limits on contributions. All the time I ran, you could have no corporate contributions. I still think that's the right thing. Corporations are people, for God's sake. You know, don't tell me that. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I think that there needs to be, you know, control over the amount of money that is given and so forth and, and very great transparency about who gives the money. But that shouldn't affect the decisions that Congress makes about, you know, whether or not it is good to uh, build a new uh, Air Force facility in my district rather than in yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where are we? Please. Thank you. Thank you for being here this afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Tori. Uh, my question has to do with um, special interest and powerful lobby versus uh, the desire for collective good. Um, you know, for a long time I've been aware that, that uh, a lot of politics and politicians get in the game uh, for something, uh, whether it's land or power or something that they have to deal with in their own area. Uh, and then a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I, I really felt like the national scene was changing to include a lot of people that were wanting to do good for the country. Um, and now it feels like there's, again, a, a backlash of special interest and powerful lobbies, whether it's energy, environment, health care, education, you name it. And, uh, you know, my question just kind of goes to, to where, do you, where do you see that situation now and, and more importantly to me, how do we wrest some of that power away so that we can make headway for collective good? You know, it's a very complicated question because a everything's a special interest. Uh, AARP is a special interest. The NEA is a special interest. The uh, Chamber of Commerce is a special interest. My guess is that the city of Aspen has a lobbyist uh, in Washington. Uh, and if not, it certainly has a lobbyist in, in Denver. Uh, so, you know, the definition of a special interest is an interest that isn't the one you're part of. <laughs> Uh, the uh, that's what makes it so special, yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> they left I, you out. I, I do think uh, <laughs> that the, what makes it really complicated. And I'll, I'll say, I, I was in a town meeting one time, or, or giving a speech rather, at a, uh, a luncheon, and there were a lot of tables like this, and people sitting around. And somebody in the back of the room, so I hope nobody else is going to do that today, <laughs> stood up and say, "Why don't you listen to us?" And I said, well, okay, which us? You, the people at that table, the people at that, which, which one? And so, you know, what is the, the common interest? What's the collective good? What is the, what's the thing that is good for the country? Well, you know, there's probably 50 different opinions of that in here. Uh, and, and so what you have to do is you have to balance these interests and you have to uh, take into account uh, 
various kinds of factors. That which, what, that which really greatly reduces the cost of groceries hurts farmers. You know, so, I mean, you, so you have all of these problems that you have to try to find the balance because there's 300 million Americans with very diverse interests. Uh, and uh, if, if we just had 10 people, we could probably get together and figure out what is going to be for our collective good. 300 million people makes it a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And getting back to what Mickey said before, you look at James Madison, his hero in government, and what he wrote in Federalist 10 is that, you know, there's going to be all these factions. There's no way to stop factions. And these factions are going to be battling each other. And what's going to come out of all this? Well, not much, is his answer. And that's fine. The federal government wasn't designed to deliver much on that. And whatever is going to come out of it is going to be at a very general plane that doesn't have a veto from all these others. So in answer to your very good question, and very, uh, it's a question steeped in political theory through the centuries, there is some view, it's a platonic view basically, that says these exceptional people will decide the public good. And aren't we lucky to have them? And that has led to a lot of trouble in history. Not everybody is Plato, and you know, a lot of them are Hitlers and Pol Pot and uh, Saddam Husseins and others who think that they know for the good. The other is, out of all this, you know, bumper cars of special interests, everybody bashing into everybody else, uh, you'll get a general position that people go along with, and uh, that'll serve the country pretty well. So it's a it's a very good question and a very big difference between the two approaches on something like that. Can, can I take a moment, Ken, though? I don't see a hand up at the moment. And uh, oh, Okay, we got, well, let, I'll, I'll be fast. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come back to it again. But uh, when you talk about the interest, you hope that if I'm elected to Congress, or Ken is, or you are, that you are going to make a rational judgment using your intelligence, your you know, feedback from your constituents, and so forth. And, I, and I, I'm not going to get off this thing about the parties. Let me use a, an example here. I was on the American Bar Association task force uh, that looked into President Bush's signing statements. 1,100 times he said, I'll decide for myself if I have to obey the law. Uh, and uh, so two of us, the president of the ABA and myself, testified before the House Judiciary Committee. And here was the interesting. There are some legal scholars who argue, Walter Dellinger, who I've debated with, who was Clinton's solicitor general, but believes this, that a president should not have to veto a bill that is a big bill that has a lot of good stuff in it just because he thinks one item is unconstitutional. He should be free to ignore it. I think that's nonsense, but you know, it, there are intelligent people who hold that view. Uh, there are others like me who think that you know, the president's like the rest of us. The, unlike Richard Nixon saying, if the president says to do it, it's not illegal. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I think the president, too, is Look supposed where to that obey the him. law. But, but uh, what I found there was that every single Democrat, without any exception, whether rich or poor, old or young, uh, rural or urban, they all thought what, the, what President Bush had done was awful, and every Democrat, even though he just said, I'm above the law, I mean, every Republican said, that's fine with us. He's one of us. Uh, and, and that pervades our system. So I, I've got to give two quick examples. Okay, but what was your view on that? Oh, I thought on the know, signing it issues, was completely was unconstitutional. Oh, yeah. Completely unconstitutional. Uh, the president has to obey the law, just like everybody else. But, but just a couple of quick examples about the way the political parties have taken over the system. If you want to go to the ballot in November to vote for somebody, for the Senate or whatever, your only choices are those people whom the two private clubs have said you could choose. So in the state of Delaware, which has a million people, Mike Castle running for the Senate was kept off the ballot by 30,000 people who voted for Christine O'Donnell in a Republican primary. Uh, in Utah, with 3 million people, a, the longtime senator, Senator Bennett, was kept off the ballot by 3,500 people who went to a convention. And the rest of us, then, then our choices were limited. Uh, redistricting, I, I'll, I'll make this very fast. Parties control redistricting. Here's what it, people think, well, what did that do to you as a congressman? Who cares what it did to me? I, I represented Oklahoma City. It's a, Oklahoma City is the same size as Boston. It's a big urban area. And I am a city dude. 
I mean, I, I, that's me. So after I'm a Republican, a first Republican elected since 1928 in my district, 74% Democrat district. It drove the Democrats nuts. So they redistricted because they controlled the, the legislature. Party decided. They said, well, we're going to get all, all the Republicans into Mickey's district and take them out of the other districts to make those safe for uh, Democrats. What happened? My district was then all the way up to the Kansas line, which is a long way. Oklahoma is a big, all of New England fits inside of Oklahoma. So, you know, all the way up to the Kansas line, halfway over to Arkansas, an upside down L. So everybody said, poor Mickey, he's got to drive so far. No, it meant all the wheat farmers and cattle ranchers in that district were now represented by a city guy who knew nothing about their issues or their interests. That's what happens when the parties control the process. Uh, and in Congress, you get elected, you, you get appointed to a committee, at least in the House of Representatives, by the party leadership that puts you on the committee if you promise to be loyal to the party position, you know, not, not to your constituents, not to your intellect, you know, not to what you think, but to the party position. We're never going to fix the problems in American politics until we get away from closed primaries, party control of redistricting, and the ability of the, of the political party leaders in Congress to dictate who, deal who does what with what issue. You'll never change it otherwise. Okay, Frida? Well, I'd like to uh, go back to the comment that was made Frida by Wallison. Frida Wallison, sorry. <laughs> um, that was made by the young man in the back about the intellectual mm -hmm. character of uh, the, the two parties, let's put it that way. At least that's how I interpreted it. Yeah. Um, and I kind of think that that illustrates um, part of what is wrong with our discourse, right? Uh, because he, in a very broad brush way, suggested that people on the left have some intellectual heft, and people on the right do not. That's stereotyping. Um, beside AEI, with which I'm fairly familiar, <laughs> um, and the Heritage Foundation, there are, of course, a number of um, people in Congress. Paul Ryan comes to mind, uh, John Kyle, uh, Tom Price, few others, many others, uh, on the Republican side who I think are among our intellectual giants in the Congress. Um, I, and, I, and there's plenty, you know, we don't have to look at the think tanks and the um, uh, people in Congress. Uh, there are plenty of media commentators, certainly some of the Wall Street Journal uh, writers um, come at uh, the the major issues of the day in a very sensible and um, intellectually uh, strong way. So um, I just point this out. Uh, I think Joe the Plumber, Mickey, um, it was a a symbol um, in that campaign uh, because of what he voiced. He, he was used because he expressed concern about tax policy. Um, I don't, you know, so I don't, I don't think he's a symbol of um, intellectual uh, power or lack thereof. Um, and, and you see that all the time. You, I'm sure, more than anybody would understand that these symbols are used in campaigns. And um, I just went through a campaign here where I was aghast, of course, <laughs> at uh, the various symbols that were being used on the other side. And um, that just happens. That, unfortunately, is part of our discourse, too. It's not pretty, uh, but I don't think it means that one side or the other has a monopoly on using those kinds of symbols. Anyway, that's Mickey, like your, your reaction? Thank you, Frida. Your reaction, Mickey? I, I would pray for intellectual discourse. Mm -hmm. I, 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 w I would pray for uh, both parties to engage not only in a civil uh, discussion about the issues, but a, a deliberate, intelligent discussion about the issues. 
uh, and oversimplification, demonization, uh, all of these things. Uh, that, uh, I made the reference to Joe the Plumber because in that particular campaign that year, the Republican Party from front to back, and I'm I, you know, very active, this is my party, uh, and the national chairman was one of our people. You know, uh, they, it, it, was, it was a party that was more based on appealing to gut emotion than to sensible thought. You know, that, and there's two sides to every issue, and you could discuss them, you know, but you don't deal with the problems of the world by gut instinct. That, that's, that was my point. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Please. Paul? Thank you. Uh, Paul Anderson. Uh, it seems that we live in an incredibly competitive culture. Uh, there's competition in school. Uh, there's competition in, uh, uh, certainly in politics. Uh, there's competition in many of our biggest institutions, probably the biggest social gatherings we have are sports competitions. Um, so I, I think it's probably natural that competition uh, rise uh, uh, and, and become a, 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 a real um, strong point or main point in, in our systems here. Um, the senator from Colorado, Mark Udall, has recently proposed that during the State of the Union address, the aisle be dissolved, that the parties mix on both sides of the aisle. And maybe this is just a symbolic gesture, but it seems that... Uh, maybe by dividing the line of scrimmage and, and doing away with it, that uh, these uh, competing uh, interests can actually, through physical proximity, come together and see some kind of union. You know, I personally think it's a good idea, Paul. Yeah, I, Paul, that's, I, a, that's, okay. that's a good observation. Actually, the, the suggestion came from uh, Mark McKinnon and Nancy Jacobson at an organization called No Labels, uh, and it is... Um, uh, I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw there, there was, uh, I think C-SPAN broadcast uh, a program on which uh, Governor Manchin, now Senator Manchin from uh, West Virginia, uh, was speaking on, on a, at a No Labels event. And he told about the shock because in West Virginia, when there was an issue to be decided, whether it was education or whatever, the members of the committee got together and they worked on it. Uh, and he sat down for the first time on the Armed Services Committee in the U.S. Senate because he was sworn in early uh, since uh, Senator Byrd had died. Uh, and uh, he was just shocked the way it immediately divided uh, into here's the Democrat camp, here's the Republican camp. Uh, and um, that, that is the problem. And, and I think if you had more mixing, I, I don't know if you all picked up a copy of this when you were upstairs. The, the program I run, I'm, I'm a vice president of the Aspen Institute, and I run the Rodell Fellowship Program, which brings together... Uh, Republican and Democrat leaders, the best young rising political stars in the country. Uh, and if you looked, that we had the sheet. Gabby Giffords was in our first class. I met Gabby in this building. Uh, and if you look at that letter, the statement that was just put out uh, honoring Gabby, it was signed by the members of her Rodell class, one of whom is the national chairman of the Republican Party, one's the Republican Attorney General of Nebraska, one is a Republican state senator in Oregon who did a fundraiser for another one of them, who's Robin Carnahan, a liberal Democrat in Missouri. Uh, you know, it, it's Tom Perez, Assistant U.S. Attorney General for Civil Rights, uh, was in that class, and he signed it. Uh, so we've got people from across, Andrew Romanoff, uh, who ran here in this uh, state for the Senate and is a liberal. So we brought people together across uh, ideology and across party. And, and so, Paul, I mean, if we can do stuff like that and we get people sitting together, my best friends in Congress, you know, half of them were Democrats. Anyways, this, this artificial division uh, is not good for the country. And so uh, I, I'm glad that Senator Udall is supporting that idea. I, I think it's a very good idea. Okay, who is next? On, who has the mic? Yeah, let me just mention while we're talking about the Rodell Fellows uh, and program that it's a wonderful, wonderful program. And <clears throat> Bill Budinger has been associated with it since the origin. He started so, it. I mean, yeah, I he know. puts it. Bill is here. But, but it's yeah. a wonderful program, and should, you should be very proud of it, Bill, and we all are proud of it. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Dorothy Atkins. Um, I guess um, the whole continuing the conversation about intellectual discourse um, about these party lines. I mean, it's one thing in this kind of venue, you know, you're, or in a classroom, you can 
um, it allows for it. Um, but the media, when we, you know, we live in a society where the media educates the masses essentially, and um, you know, with the Giffords that's happened and you know, Palin's blood libel or in use of these kind of um, extreme rhetoric, uh, f you know, extreme terminologies. Um, what, how, what is your solution for it? I mean, I mean, I th and it's not only the right. I think the left is just as bad. Um, how do we? You know, what should what do you do? Well, you're right. The, the left is just as bad. It was Obama who said, "Well, if they bring a knife, we'll bring a gun." I mean, you know, Democratic political consultants and Republican consultants all target districts. I mean, they all do that, and they all put you know sights on on districts that are their targeted districts. I, I you know, there's only one answer to every one of these problems. It's the same answer to every problem. Uh, it's the American people have to stand up. So I don't know who's the congressman from this district, but, but when they come back and they do a town meeting, first of all, if they do a town meeting and you're not there, then you're the problem. Uh, and if, they, if they're there uh, and they start using this terminology, let me tell you the story about what happened to me. Uh, I, I learned things the hard way. That's the only way. You've got to beat me over the head. So I was, um, I was having a town meeting. Uh, in my uh, district, and somebody asked me why I hadn't done something. I don't remember the issue. I wish I did, and I re really wish I remembered the name of the person who did it. Uh, but he said, well, ask me why I didn't do something. Well, I gave the answer. I gave, you know, we all give the politicians, we give the answer. I said, we're in the minority. I'm a Republican. We don't control either house. The, bad, the Democrats control the other house. They won't let us bring it up for a vote. And this person stood up and he said, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Democrat this, Republican that, and everybody in the room cheered. And I never did it again. You want it to stop, go to the town meetings, meet with the senators, meet with the legislators, meet with the council members, and say, get off this kick. You know, we, we are tired of the name calling. We're tired of the blaming. You know, we, we have one country. Obama was right. It's not red America. It's not blue America. It, it is that way more than he wants to recognize, but it shouldn't be. You know, and we have to force our like, elected officials to think of us as a country, as a country. I, I did this um, talk about fact check. I had the biggest fact checker in the world. Uh, I write for The Atlantic, and I wrote a column uh, in which I talked. I don't remember how I led into it, but about this story. It's, it's just a story, right? Uh, that when Ben Franklin walked out of the uh, convention <laughs> hall after the Constitution was written, that a lady stopped him and said, what kind of government have you given us? Uh, and that his response was, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Uh, and I saw, you know, it was a story. Well, Walter Isaacson, who is the world's biggest expert on Ben Franklin, called me up immediately. He said, it's not a rumor. It happened. Here's who said it. Here's where they said it. Here's the day they said it. Uh, uh, and, you know, it is. It's up to us. It's not up to some elected elites in Denver or uh, Washington to try to keep the system decent and civil and intelligent. We've got to demand it. Democracy is not a spectator sport. You know, so any of you who don't go to a town meeting, any of you don't meet with your country, you're to blame. It's, it's your country. You know, it's not just the people you send up there to do this job for you. Okay, Mickey, let, let me press you and we'll get, we'll get your, hold your hold your question. I just want to press you a little bit on the party thing. We understand the message on civility, and I think that it's a wonderful message, and thank you for delivering it, and thank you for running the program that really represents it. But um, you're not saying do away with parties, because there's no democracy without political parties. No. You're not saying that parties shouldn't stand for something. No. You don't want them to be tweedly D and tweedly dumb. No. You want them to have a thrust. So what is it that you want besides the civility? I understand well, that message. Um, you but know, what, what would you do with the parties? When, uh, when the sun comes up in the morning, your, your thought is, well, that's the way it's always been, right? And there are political parties that, that control elections and control who's on the ballot and control, because that's the way it's always been, right? Yeah. No. I mean, that came out of the progressive movement in the late 1800s and early 1900s. California just voted to do away with closed primaries. Washington State has done away with closed primaries. Louisiana long ago did away with closed primaries. Nine states have, you know, nonpartisan, you know, independent redistricting commissions. I'm not saying do away with parties, but take away from them the ability to choose who we can vote for and who can sit on the committees that decide the important decisions we make. Okay, let me you press know. you on that. 
it, the point is you have elections that are uh, <clears throat> from both parties. I mean, that's what an election is. Now, to nominate somebody, why don't you have Republicans choosing who's going to represent the Republican Party, Democrats choosing who's going to represent the Democratic Party, instead of Democrats choosing who's going to represent the Republican Party, and Republicans choosing who... And I guess I want two candidates who are different. I want a choice. Yeah. I don't yeah. want uh, the mushy middle. Oh, choose. it's not mushy middle. You do get a choice. But, you know, the, the, er, let people run. Everybody wants to they run on one ballot. You get a lot of choice. Uh, and then if nobody gets over 50%. Then they don't stand for anything. Oh, that's not true. true. That's not true. Okay. I mean, look at the people who got it elected in, in uh, places like Louisiana who, who are not centrist. They're not mushy middle. You know, he, people talk about what's in our Constitution. Let me tell you something that's in our Constitution that is very different. The Founding Fathers knew Parliament. They knew the parliamentary system. They deliberately rejected the parliamentary system. Uh, and we have a provision that nobody, if you named every provision in the Constitution, you'd forget this one. <laughs> and, and it is the one that says every member of the House or Senate has to be a resident of the, a citizen of the state from which they're elected. In Great Britain, you can represent Essex if you've never, don't couldn't find it on a map. You know, the whole idea was that we were supposed to have people making decisions who heard the voice of the people, and that was supposed to be an important part of their decision-making process. And, and you know, so that to, to just artificially cut off their ability to choose among all the people who might want to run uh, is, um, is is is. I think it's giving us the worst kind of, of government, actually. But uh, and that's why I saw the result of it. I mean. When Sotomayor was nominated and Kagan was nominated, almost every Democrat was on one side, almost every Republican. You know, it wasn't that way when, when uh, Brandeis was nominated. It wasn't that way when Frankfurter wasn't nominated. It wasn't that way when Medicare was passed. It wasn't that way when Social Security was passed. You know, this is new, Ken. You know, that it's we are... Auto My senator, Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma... Uh, said, I, I forget whether it was Kagan or Sotomayor when they were going around making the rounds, I don't need to meet with her. I already know I'm going to vote against her. You know, I mean, please. Please. Yeah, yeah Steve Nemirovsky. Um, I spent most of my life in and out of government back in Illinois. I've uh, lobbied the pre president when he's a state senator. I've gone through Bogoyevich. I just went through the tax increase that you've all heard about the last few weeks. And I've thought about all the same problems you've thought about today, and I agree with most of what you've said. Uh, so much, and I've thought about this a lot. In fact, I, I published a book recently. My theory is the only way to break the logjam is to have a legitimate third party in our country. And I was uh, very hopeful to see that Thomas Friedman wrote about this uh, in the New York Times recently. And no matter how much both of you today went up a, a, about this and talked about the issue and talked about parties, no one seems to be able to get there mentally that we have to have a legitimate third party. Uh, no labels is not a party. Uh, the Tea Party is not a party. And I just wish that someone could step forward, devote the time and energy, because a lot of the things you talk about, breaking the law jam, redistricting, polling, if you don't have a third party there to force that debate and to force it, I don't think you can solve these problems. What's the name of your book? Funny you should ask. E-Party. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that? E-Party. What, what, what angle of the Tea Party? Pa no, mine's E-Party. 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 Okay, good. Well, yeah, just a couple of comments on that. I... Um, I am not an advocate of third parties unless a third party is a you know a third general party. Um, the The problem is parties tend to be narrow, so you would get a, a another party that had its people with a very narrow agenda they were going to be adhering to. You know, so I don't, if two parties are are awful, three parties could be worse. Uh, um, so I you know I don't know that I want to go that route, but I I do think more choice would be good. And I want to make something clear. I am very much for civility, and I am very much for recognizing that we are a very diverse country. I have not anywhere today said I am for the mushy middle, that I'm for the moderates, for the centrist. Every great move now, now if you're going to pass a budget, it's important to be able to really compromise and get all these ideas together. Uh, if you're going to be able to you know, provide for your national defense, you've got to be able to do that. But all of the great movements 
from the founding of the Republic to the Civil Rights Movement to the Women's Movement to the Labor Movement have come from people who were not in the center. Not in the center. You know, the mushy middle leaves you in a bad spot. It's a mud hole. Okay. Uh, last question. Yeah, please. Hi. Um, my name's Christina Dumitrescu, and I agree with you in uh, what you said earlier that the American public is not just um, uninformed, it is now misinformed. But that's not just true in terms of how we're misinformed from our media, from the internet, Twitter, where you only have 140 characters to write. Um, it's also happening uh, with our, our congressman. The new congressional session opened with a reading of the Constitution that omitted several parts, such as the three-fifths clause. And I was wondering what you thought about that. I, I, I have actually been really amazed to uh, watch people citing the Constitution who appear not to have any idea what's in it. Uh, and uh, yeah, But look, I, I, I want to be... Critical. I mean, the, um, there, there's some pervasiveness here. I don't know. I'm not asking you to be honest. But when I said the president's not the head of government, I imagine a number of you were shocked to hear that. Uh, to, I, I was in a discussion earlier today where people were talking about, you know, what, you know, the, the internal contradiction between all men are created equal and the three-fifths clause, right? That, that, that a black is, is worth, or a slave is worth three-fifths of a person. Well, that's not a good, that, one was the Declaration of Independence, which was the aspirational document. The other was the Constitution 12 years later when they tried to write a, a law to bring the country together. Now, you, there's still real problems with it, but the lack of knowledge of our system and our Constitution and our, uh, how our government works uh, is, is pervasive, and I'm not surprised at all to hear people demand that we adhere to the Constitution, you know, when, when what they cite is not in any Constitution I've ever read. You know, so, um, you know, we have to be informed and we have to call them on it, and we have, we have to say that's not what the Constitution says. Uh, it, it, it is a problem. Misinformation uh, is a serious problem. Look, I I'm, shouldn't even say this. It's not only at that level. Two years ago, I think it was, two years, three years, I go to the Ideas Festival. I love the Ideas Festival. We, we had an event in Door Hosier where I think it was Kennedy, the, the historian, uh, was talking about how we are different from uh, uh, Britain because in Britain, head of state and head of government are two different people because they've got the queen. Uh, but uh, in America, our difference was that we combined head of state and head of government. I wanted to stand up and say, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, uh, we don't have a head of government. But... And so at every level, professors, historians don't know the Constitution, don't know our system. Uh, the reporters who cover stories, there's somebody had a story in the Washington Post the other day that was talking about the custom of taking a bill. This was a problem. It slowed down the process. And all. There had been a custom grow up in Congress of when an issue came, you know, that they took it into a committee so that people could mess with it. That's the way you write the bills. It's not a bill until after you've gone through the amendment process. So, I mean, the people who are covering politics for the Washington Post don't know what they're talking about. And this is a serious problem. Look, I, I, I want to make clear that the blame goes a lot of places. You're not going to like everything I say here. The gun that shot Gabby was sold at a sporting goods store and the ammunition was sold at, a, at another store now, I'm not going to say we shouldn't stop people. But where, where's the corporate management? Where's the moral view of the corporate owners? When, when, if you don't like either uh, Hannity or Beck or, or Limbaugh or Keith Olbermann, or, who are the people who are, who are sponsoring, running the ads, sponsoring those things? You know, the, the moral degradation and the civic degradation are coming from real people who are pursuing the buck, and they don't care what the fallout is. So the blame for where we are with the problems in our society lie in a lot of different places. And, and I, you know, I think we've we got to do something about trying to reclaim the country, you know, for, you know, common sense and decency and civility and thought and deliberation because we've really gotten away from it. But, uh, Mickey, you, your passionate 
plea with us was wonderful and very well expressed. And, and no, no, we, we, we got the message very, very <coughs> clearly and everything. But why don't you leave us with a happy story and uh, tell us something funny that happened in uh, your political career so that we go out not all gloom and doom no, look, I mean, and we go out loving each other. Well, you can't do this because the uh, the sessions are closed. Uh, Bill Budinger is, is in here, as you pointed out, who uh, is a trustee and who created uh, the Rodell program that I run. I guarantee you that if well, look at the names on the on the the letter. Uh, no, you know, funny honoring story. Gabby. We want a funny story. I, I don't I don't know any funny stories. I you know Newt Gingrich once pretended to be smart. I mean that was that was kind of. Um, a little hilarious to me, but um, you know. But but was the there thing, a funny episode that happened in your years in Congress that when you look back and you say that was funny? I mean, I'm sure. Give me enough time to get it. I could think of it, but I mean, none none jump up at it. You know, I want but to leave people on it. If you look at a lot of the young people who are the now the state attorney generals and state treasurers and speakers of the state houses and all. There are a lot of really, really good, smart, uh, civil, decent, young political leaders in the country. You know, the, 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 the downside is it, it, I select these people, the program selects them. It's not a cross-section. You know, every one of them is probably a minority in their own, you know, party or their own uh, legislative uh, seat or whatever. But but there are good people out there. You know, this is this is still, you know, a great country, and, and uh, I believe in it fiercely. Um, so I don't know a funny story, but but uh, but I know uh, I I am I'm hopeful. Uh, and you, somebody, you know, you mentioned Paul Ryan, and and uh, you can mention people on the other side as well. Uh, I just as I was flying out here, uh, I was at Reagan Airport in in Washington. Uh, and had coffee because I ran into an old friend of mine, Tony Hall, uh, who is a Democratic congressman from Ohio, a liberal. Uh, his big thing is eradicating hunger, and then he was appointed, I think it was by Clinton, to uh, be an ambassador on uh, fighting hunger. A good friend of mine. Uh, there are really good people out there. We just need to give them the support and the system that they need to be able to uh, to control things. But I, I don't... You know, no jokes. I, let you know, I don't let us all thank Mickey Edward for a wonderful, wonderful session.